Dear colleagues and friends, welcome back to the FIB Conceptual Design Podcast Series. In this episode, I am hosting Urs Meister. Together with Johannes Käferstein, Urs runs his architectural practice since 1996. Currently, their team is composed of seven employees and their projects cover a wide range from residential to industrial, including transformations of buildings with a high heritage value. In parallel to his architectural practice, Urs is an associate professor at the University of Liechtenstein, where he holds different lectures and studios. I hope you will enjoy our conversation as much as I did. And now, without further delay, I bring you Urs Meister. Hello, Urs. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> well, to start off, I would like to ask you um, about your background. Maybe you tell a little story about how you came to be an architect, why you choose this profession. <laughs> Did it maybe just happen to you or was it uh, a conscious choice? Um, to be perfectly honest, it was the third choice on a list <laughs> when I was like <laughs> 19 years old. And I, I very much compare it to, to my daughter, which is 21 now. She just started architecture. And it was not her first choice, obviously. It, yeah. it was like a blueprint of what I did years before. So I just wanted to do art, maybe teach in art. Uh, they didn't let me into the so, so-called four course at the Zurich uh, Arts Academy. So I had to decide for something else. Uh, the yeah. guitar was a little bit too private for me. So I chose for architecture. I didn't have a, a special idea of what architects do. And my family was not concerned with architecture at all. So it was just a jump into the water somehow. But uh, I think it was quite interesting to, to try to swim in it. And uh, I found, um, yeah, interest in it mm -hmm. somehow. Went out to Berlin then in the education. I I'd studied at the ETH and stayed in Berlin for three years. Studied there at the school as well, at the art school, which is a totally different system where you are together with sculptors and uh, artists. It's like a different microcosm as a ETH, where you have like technical facilities and all that stuff. Uh, so I enjoyed that very much, but I came back to do my diploma in Zurich at ETH because at that time we had really good teachers at the school. And in Berlin, I somehow had, I think that for me, it was a little bit like finished the array at the Arts Academy there. And then I started pretty early with uh, doing projects with friends. I also worked in the office of Ernst Giesel for some months. Yeah. At that time, I found him pretty old fashioned. And in recent years, I must admit that his architecture is really, really strong. So it took a while until <laughs> I really found out what it is. Uh, I founded the, the office with Johannes Käferstein then um, pretty early and since 25, almost 26 years we're working on projects and we're also teaching uh, in the beginning. He was teaching in London afterwards. We were teaching together at the University of Liechtenstein. He left then in 2008 and now he's uh, running actually the school in Lucerne the architecture school and I'm still professor in Liechtenstein and these are like the two let's say feet on which our office is standing so one side is the academia the other side is the office and the creative business and also the making practice yeah and let's say when you are in the in the teaching side uh, do, you, do you also have something else that you're doing at the university aside from teaching do you also have some it's a research project with the students or make, could you maybe call it a continuous research with the students and what are your ideas that you're researching for when you work with them? Uh, at the University in Liechtenstein we have a long and ongoing uh, actually project uh, with Erasmus networks in which we try to bring together not only universities uh, and different cultures of construction, and I think it's about construction mainly, but also we try to, to work on mainly on, on, on the spirit of the structure. Uh, and we try to go on with this mainly in the last year with wood, wooden construction, because this is a big uh, theme 
in, in Vorarlberg, Liechtenstein, in the Alpine region generally. And uh, this is pretty interesting to work together with the, the Norwegian schools uh, or also the Netherlands schools, how they think conceptually about wood constructions. So this is a stream of research, you, you might call it research, but we often do it or mainly do it with the studios, I mean with the design studios. Yeah. So um, this is where we are pretty successful, I guess, bringing together people and, and try to bring together also the, the companies like uh, the carpenters, mm -hmm. the firms, the professionals, the students and the teachers. Uh, and we really like to do one-to-one -one projects. This is kind of not a hobby, but this is kind of a thing. We think that with one-to-one -one projects, students profit a lot in making actually constructions. Could you explain what you mean by one-to-one -one project? One-to-one uh, -one means actually building the, the, the designs that you developed uh, within a few weeks. Yeah. Uh, you, we, we often start with a one-to-one -one scale uh, with wood constructions. Then we go back into models in one to ten. We draw, we do all kinds of things. And at the very end, in some projects, we could even build the, the buildings. One example is, is a model workshop we could do behind the school in Liechtenstein, which is finished with the students within um, seven, eight months. Uh, there was a collaboration between two studios, almost 60 students were working on it. And um, at the end, of course, we had support by some craftsmen, but it was a combination of, of different worlds that finished up in a, in a building that is still standing and we are working in it. It's a model workshop, so we do our models there. Okay, yeah, that, that's really cool. Yeah. I think, yeah, timber is really good for that because you can build it and you can take it apart. It's very light. You can work with, very easily with it. With exactly. concrete, it's more difficult. That's true. Uh, we also had workshops uh, in the previous sessions with Erasmus intensive programs, which were like summer schools. We had a different kind of materials that we were tackling. So one was concrete. Mm -hmm. We did it in Denmark. And the issue was there uh, to work with freeform concrete with textile formwork. Yeah. This was super interesting because it's somehow a contradiction to work with textile, which is uh, light, which is tensile, which is a different world than concrete and then you try to pour concrete into this light material which has to act then together with the mass of the concrete so the formwork actually creates the form and it's not a finished work in your mind that this is trying to to figure out what what the finished work is you know? yeah it's very interesting because it's choosing by its own the perfect shape also exactly. for the for the load bearing structure so exactly that, there was a lot of uh, prototyping of course and at the end we did a little bridge we did uh, like uh, organic walls and you never knew exactly what what would be the finished object because you in prototyping it's different it's small and in pouring in like two tons of concrete uh, the material works differently so this was pretty interesting and i would love to go on with concrete but uh, on the other hand uh, it takes a little bit more time in developing things. Yeah, yeah. I think that's maybe something com completely different that an owner, for example, would like to have. Like, uh, usually we think of people that commission you to build a building, that you give them the exact geometry, that you give them the exact shape, they want the angles to be perfect, they want the surface to be perfect, and it might be difficult to find a client who wishes to go on in a experiment like that with you? Yeah, maybe, but I think there are clients everywhere and all around the world who are interested in experimental uh, expressive, expressive uh, research. And maybe you, you can think about small scale projects in the beginning and then develop out of it uh, larger projects. But there are a lot of examples in the 60s where they, they especially they, they, they did these walls or um, even bubbles in concrete yeah in yeah. the southern part of france there there's a beautiful kind of mushroom um building consisting of these these eggs eggs co are combined to to a kind of a, a super apartment in the midst of a forest and it's a thin shell it's like an eggshell structure 
Uh, do you have uh, the reference for that? Uh, yes, it's Anti Lovak. Anti with two T. Yeah. Lovak is the second name. Okay, yeah, we might uh, have looked that up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And do you have sometimes an experience with your students that they come up with an idea that's completely outside your box of thought and you go like, wow, this is amazing and how, how come I never thought about it? Could you, could you tell me a story about that happened to you? Yeah, that's like actually the, the, the usual case. So in the <laughs> university, you expect students to be creative because they do not know everything, they just do. And I think it's a, a superpower they have. And we should also think about <laughs> keeping it in our profession. Yeah. So they just do. And mainly you can give them whatever you want to and they try to, to create something which the end of the whole process they wouldn't know. And that's actually the, the, always the case in every design project, especially in construction, because they're not so aware of, of load bearing and the forces that create tensions and so on. So they just do. And together with them, you find a path to somehow organize the, the whole design in order to be um, structural at the very end and in the same time expressive or new. And I guess every day when you, you work with students is like, yeah, it's like a gift what they have. <laughs> to, yeah. to be able to, to think outside of the box, we will call it, or to think naturally and differently. Yeah, I like to compare it with the example when, when we try to rearrange our living room. I discuss uh, with my girlfriend, we have an idea in mind, we, we start to make a mess in the room, we uh, pull around the, the chairs and the, the tables, and then we're in, when we're in the middle of it, we kind of think, okay, actually the first idea that we had is crap. We're going to do something completely different. Mm -hmm. And for me, it shows the thing that the, the creative process really comes by doing. Yeah. So it's not something that comes just out of your mind. It's come out of your hand, out of your actions, and then or your drawings perhaps. And then you have something new that you didn't think about. Mm -hmm. I think that's case. exactly the case, and there's also a, there, there's a, a whole bunch of literature in the recent years about making and touching things. If you think about Johanny Palasma, he, he has the, 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 this nice sentence, sentence about the thinking hand. So the, the hand is not only drawing, but whatever the hand touches is kind of uh, creating thoughts, and usually uh, especially architects or engineers have the idea, I have to have some kind of an idea and out of this idea I do the sketch and then the sketch will be uh, composed to something different and at the end it's a building or a construction or a structure. I think it's different. Yeah. It's the other way around. So whatever you do with your hands, be it a drawing or be it a mock-up or whatever, I think out of this making uh, the, the, the force for creation is, is deriving somehow. Yeah, And what you described before is the process of making. I think this is very actually fruitful. And there, if you think about uh, the product that you want to have at the very end, too early, of course, you have to keep it in mind. But uh, you have to open your mind. And also, if you work with clients, you have to tell them it's a process how to reach that goal. And the process is not linear. It's always like... Yeah. <laughs> there are many ways and, and many threads are entangled with each other and maybe you even come up with the, with the first idea at the very end of this process but it's going to be a different one even if it looks the same you know yeah and this processual thinking is, is really something that we need to cultivate it's somehow in the DNA of architects I would say but you often have to talk about it with clients they have to get into this kind of world of making, thinking, uh, and then if they accept it at a certain moment, uh, they easily follow you also with these kind of deviations. Do you have a strategy in your daily practice where you look for ideas? Um, let's say outside of being here and drawing, do you have something like, I don't know, going for a walk in a special place or um, 
some kind of ritual where when you're stuck that you know that you can go to to free your mind so that you you can go on no i think that's a, an idealistic perspective of, of the of the profession <laughs> of architects maybe because in the, in the daily business you're often so bumped with with clients with technicalities so you almost have no time to take a walk or but of course you're right sometimes uh, if you think uh, something is missing in the design it takes time i think time is the key and then often after two weeks you find an idea that comes somehow but you, i wouldn't force it too much in in, in a ritual it yeah. never happens uh, when you expect it so I think it happens exactly then where you, when you're, for instance, um, in a different city, sometimes you see things in books. It's it's a whole world that is around you and you just have to open your eyes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, I, I think going outside is, is already some, something good. And um, I think sometimes you need to digest Uh, all the inputs that you get and today you have to digest what you're doing you have to digest project otherwise it cannot go on so you need these kind of moments where you're not on the project and you're on something else and then it's kind of an unconscious digestion <laughs> yeah very much so and i think time is really of essence uh, because sometimes something is missing and you don't know exactly what it is And in doing different things, also going to the university, to talking to students, often they do things and suddenly uh, something appears that you could use in your own practice. And this is, a, I think, a benefit bo for both sides. It's not like you can take this wooden uh, kind of knot and, and use it in a, in, a, in a project, but I think some references come up and uh, this is like the... the how would you say, the Nährboden in, in, in German, like uh, it, it's, it's the ground where, where the, the seeds uh, grow, grow yeah, and yeah. become plants, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you. So I, maybe we can move on. Do you have a favorite style in architecture? This is a huge question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can develop it as much as you like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So maybe just be reminded, not all of our audience are architects. Yep. So you can maybe give a basic answer and then you can develop it into more detail. Mm -hmm. So maybe the first approach is when we were studying back in the 80s, it was a kind of a dark age for me at, at least, uh, you started in, in the... Uh, let's say in the end of the modern age at the ETH at that time. Yeah. Especially in the beginning of the 80s. And, and it was a little bit formalistic, let's say so. So the modern movement in architecture was a little bit strict, you know. And um, I think style as a word you could not use. Mm -hmm. Also beauty as a word was prohibited. So you could Oh, talk okay. about beauty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a bit strict, a bit Protestant maybe, I'm not sure. Anyhow, I think afterwards, the, the, with the influence maybe of, of Aldo Rossi, who came in the 70s to the ETH, and then uh, many architects started to, to, to redevelop also the, the, the threats back to tradition, then it became obvious that actually there's a huge... Um, library of architecture worldwide that you can use <laughs> yeah <laughs> there are so many references and so many good architectures and urban spaces that actually you need to harvest and this is what we found out later so um i couldn't especially say now what the style is that i would prefer because maybe you don't think in styles maybe you just think in characters cultures building cultures yeah right now we have like uh, it also goes on and on in time you know mm -hmm. right now we do a little kind of a project which is a brick building it's tinted black uh, white yeah. but you still see the brick <laughs> and there's a huge roof on top of it you could see it on the wall there and uh, we have the impression that uh, these are like two cultures within one building and we would take out the roof of course 
and then create something that goes back to the initial idea of these tinted brick buildings of the maybe Scandinavian um, culture. Yeah. And there we have many references that we like, especially Alvar Aalto, Sigurd Leverenz, you know, these architects mm -hmm. yeah. that everybody knows. They're world famous from the 50s to the 70s or even before. And these are references that you have always in the back of your head. And sometimes they come together, sometimes they fall apart. Uh, but it's hard to define a style and I think it's not even necessary. But what we are interested in is the, the tradition of architectures that are, are dealing with the material, maybe. So we like material, yeah. especially bricks, wood, also concrete, also these, these tactile architectures that are, are trying to, 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 to create something out of the properties of the material. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you like to show your material in, in your buildings? or Yes. Very much. Okay, uh, that's cool. <laughs> uh, this is not something that well, it comes naturally somehow, but I think that that's the potential of architecture and also engineers uh, should work like that. Uh, one thing is material and the other thing might be the structure. We are big fans of structures. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah. We really like uh, structures that are somehow uh, protagonists of the spaces. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this can be a column, this can be walls. And we really like to expose structure and also the material, especially like uh, masonry walls, brick walls, which are load bearing. Yeah. The more you see, the more you get, you know? Yeah. So, so you, you, let's say you like to walk into a building and feel the, the load bearing structure around you, feel the building uh, holding up all exactly. around you. If that's possible, that's not always easy to do. Because mainly uh, in, in uh, residential buildings, you have some criteria, you know, you have rooms uh, which have to follow certain rules and, and measures and structure is not such a huge uh, issue often, but we always try it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For instance, we did a house uh, at the lakeside in Zurich where the chimney is in the one, in one of the apartments, the chimney is in the middle of the space more or less not in the middle exactly and it's a concrete chimney which is also at the end the, the chimney became some kind of a sculpture between load bearing structure and uh, a fireplace at the end we called it fireplace house <laughs> <laughs> and if you know what is on top of this chimney the two stories above we did some axonometric drawings afterwards uh, you feel that there's a certain um, potential in it or let's say it has to do something for the house yeah. it's not only a nice piece you, you can uh, light the fire it's also mandatory to be there and it's like an actor on, on uh, let's say in, within the apartment and I think at the very end you can feel it that there's some importance mm -hmm. to it mm -hmm. I really liked that you said the word beauty because uh, the first person who taught me about architecture said the most important thing in architecture is to make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's like when you, when the engineers say the most important feature of engineering, it's that it's holding up. <laughs> so bringing those two together is really a challenge. Yeah, it is. And, and I think beauty is something that has to derive from something, you know? And this is why we talk about structure and material. I think beauty is not there and you can do something beautiful. Of course, you, it has to be beautiful at the very end. But often people have the idea to, to, to erect something which is beautiful is, is coming from outside, like a masquerade or like a makeup. Yeah. I think it comes from within, mm -hmm. from the beauty of the structure or from the logic even of the structure or from the, the logic of the material. And if you combine these things in a clever way, it becomes beautiful in itself. Best case, you know. Yeah. Of course, you need some, let's say, talent and some time and energy. I think that's uh, the, 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 the biggest part is time and energy. Because the more you work on it, the better it gets usually. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a mystical word, isn't it? Because when you feel that something is beautiful, you say it's beautiful because maybe you didn't find another word to describe your feeling and to describe, in that case, the structure or the building. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but you feel that something is there. Yes. And, and in that sense, beauty is, is such a broad term that it's hard to discuss it. Maybe there are other terms that are a bit more precise, although I mentioned now tectonics, you know? Yeah. If you talk to engineers, it, it, it's a word that you can use. If you talk to, to somebody on the streets, they wouldn't know what tectonic is. But I think... Maybe you could give a description of what tectonic <laughs> is because I'm not sure that everyone understands. <laughs> Let's say tectonic is the second part of the work of architect or architecture, you know? So architecton... So the, the word itself, tecton, means carpenter initially. Mm -hmm. And the, the interesting thing is, this is Greek, of course, but the interesting thing is that in certain cultures, the tecton, the, the carpenter, is not only the, the woody guy that does some structures and that's it, especially in, in Japan. He does not only the structure of the house, he does also the furniture, he does like the, the woodwork, like a schreine in German. And he's the architect of the whole house. Yeah. So there's a kind of a huge uh, kind of... A, it's a world of the tecton in that <laughs> sense. And in our culture, uh, tectonic means to be able to put things together. To uh, That's a definition. Put like sticks together in a logical way. Yeah. Uh, and interweave them to a whole okay. structure. Yeah. yeah. And this is the th actually your everyday business, yeah. you know, as an engineer. <laughs> But I think it becomes tectonic if you can see and feel it, that it is logic. Yeah. So you can also talk about facades that are tectonic uh, without seeing like uh, sticks and, and uh, the structure in itself. But you thinking about the depth of a facade, for instance, where the panel of the window is attached to the, the brickwork, uh, all these kind of reflections on the depth and mm -hmm. in the end about the load-bearing structure of the facade. Um, these come together in the best sense. If you, yeah, you could call it tectonic if it really works. Yeah. It's a bit, uh, it's, it's not as sharp as it could be. Uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, more defined than beauty, but I think the essence of beauty can come from, from the tectonic work of the architect yeah. and the engineer. I would like at this moment maybe to throw in something else, which is proportions. I think maybe that's the, like kind of the second pillar that uh, you're founding your work on. And I found that proportion is this kind of thing. Like you have, you have some kind of laws of physics, for example, or engineering or chemistry, and you can apply those laws to whether something is very small or it's very big. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you can apply, uh, for example, the law of physics to a small uh, ball moving around and to an airplane flying. So there's two objects, they are very different uh, in size and in mass, but you can apply the same laws of physics. Or do you have some basic laws in architecture that can you apply to different structures where they are small, like let's say a uh, one house, um, one family house building and a skyscraper. And that you use like in your design process to achieve the same beauty. Yeah, maybe yes. I think at the very end, even a skyscraper or a rocket or whatever it is, it, it has to be constructed. So the, yeah. there are little things <laughs> that you have to put together And it gets bigger and bigger. And there's, uh, there's laws of repetition, laws of proportion, rhythm. Uh, and you always have to deal with this. It doesn't even matter how, how large it is. Of course, the larger a structure becomes, the less playful it is usually. So very small objects can be like a single family house or a, a caravan or whatever it is, a, a little piece of furniture. They can be very playful and extraordinary. And if you scale it up and you, you do like a high-rise building or even an urban part of, of a city, it has to become a little bit more regular. But the main ingredients that you just uh, talk about, the proportional work or the, the, the idea about series, when does it stop, when does it begin, where does it begin, <laughs> where does it stop, all that stuff, it, it's, 
actually in the DNA of the, the creator. You have to be able to deal with it. Otherwise, you, you have no tools. Yeah. No criteria. Yeah. And I don't think that there are... We, of course, everybody knows the modular of Le Corbusier. <laughs> he had this very rigid <laughs> system of meshes. And I think... Uh, he has also some very strange proportions, this modular. I think so, too. So, for instance, the room height of 226 is really compressed. It's interesting because it's so compressed that you have the urgent need to, to break it up. And then you have the need for double heights. Yeah. That's nice. But at the very end, I think it was interesting for him to, to regulate his own work and to do some kind of a propaganda. I'm the modular guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can rule the world yeah. with my own measures. Yeah. Uh, I'm Da Vinci, you know. Uh, but I think in the daily work of architects, it's not so much the precise measures. It's more the, the thinking about proportions, which mm -hmm. you do intuitively, usually. Yeah. Do you think Le Corbusier is still a hot topic today? In my opinion, yes. But maybe different as I saw it uh, before. In, in, when I was in the education, still I had this idea of uh, this is a guy, an awkward guy. He, do, he does all kind of things. He's a bit... Uh, he did these pamphlets and these... these little books uh, talking yeah. about stuff that I didn't understand too much. But the le uh, in, in recent years, I really found out that this guy was, was actually super creative. Uh, I don't like his paintings, for instance. So this uh -huh. part of the creativity is not my thing. But um, in every project, he invented a kind of a new world. And he, he, he never ended, you know. He worked with colors. He worked with all kinds of constructions. Uh, he, with arches in bricks, Catalan vaults. He, he, he was interested also in the in the later phase after the World War. He was interested very much in in, in rough materials, like the brutalism world. Yeah, yeah. Somehow also was pushed by by him. Arbru, not only but also beton bru yeah. came together, and this was like the, the opening up the eyes again for for the beauty of materials. Yeah. Whereas the modern thinking before the, the Second World War was very much focused on reduction and plastered walls, white cubes. And there he somehow also had kind of a path through the, the different decades together with the, all yeah. the other architects. Yeah, I mean, from what I know is that he discovered uh, Beton Brut actually by chance because they had some <laughs> defaults on the, on the construction site and then they had this concrete column. And one morning he arrives to, to this construction site in Paris and he, he just saw the, the concrete, the exposed concrete, and he said, okay, okay, stop everything. We're going to leave it like this and it's going to be the, the Beton Brut. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's a story that he invented. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had, he, he, there was so much marketing. I mean, he couldn't do uh, uh, otherwise, but uh, I think it might be even true. Yeah. And if you, this is also what I like in the profession. If you only talk to, to, to teachers in the universities, uh, which are not building, it's, it's a different distance to the material. And we really try to have one foot in, in the, in the excavation pit somehow, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and exactly what you described, like seeing the concrete falling apart, uh, and feeling the beauty of it. Uh, that's, that's something that can trigger your whole work somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you, you sent me some projects that uh, I had a look into. Yeah. And maybe I would start with um, the, the Koch areal. And I saw that it's kind of a mid-height building. So one of my questions that I like to ask is, uh, what is the difference for you between... Uh, the urban planning, for example, in Dubai, where you have lots of skyscrapers versus, for example, the suburbs in the USA, where you only have one family houses. And do you think that the, the golden ratio is somewhere in between those? Mm, I'm not sure. So the golden ratio, you always have to apply to context. And the Koch building, which you call... Um, medium building for, for our office it's 
a little bit larger of the buildings. It somehow looks like a smaller building than it really is. It's 25 meters and it's five story, looking like a five story building because yeah. it's over height spaces. These are industrial spaces for of 550 or even 580 yeah. that you can use for a company or a woodworker or whatever, or a beer brewer. Mm -hmm. And so we try to, to give this, this building uh, this kind of um, look of a five-story building, although it is almost 10. Uh -huh, if it would yeah. be an apartment building, it would like, look like a 10-story 10, 10 building. And we, we really like the idea of this, this heights, you know, this, this, this not double heights. You can put in a gallery if you want to, but it's uh, some kind of an exaggeration of the, the usual scale. And I think there, in the context of the Kocharel, it really makes sense to put in this kind of brick. It's kind of an urban brick that reacts on all sides to, towards the park with some kind of a loggia, which is pretty playful, which is also, uh, there's a lot of greenery growing there. And other sides are a little bit more tough, like an industrial building needs mm -hmm. to look like. Yeah. And it's somehow a medium scale between maybe yeah, what you described the low rise of america or also if you think about japan the two-story houses everywhere uh, and the the high-rise centers i think if we talk about zurich now there is a, a high-rise just next to the, the the building in kocharel yeah it's going to be 70 or 80 meters even it's an apartment building mm -hmm. high-rise and i think this is much more Speaking about density, of course, it's a dense building and you have a park nearby. So you can argue, yes, uh, there's a kind of a compensation, a high building towards an empty space with greenery. It's kind of a logic that we uh, know from modern um, ideas. But I think it's about the sculpture idea of a city, you know. So the, the high rise building there makes a lot of sense because it's kind of a needle within the context, which yeah. is a little bit yeah let's say four or five story high it's a little bit monotonous but also nice and this kind of needle together with the park works very well our building next to it is pretty blocky but it works with this kind of a double scale that we just talked about and you couldn't say there's a there's a yes or no for the high rise or for the lower building or medium sized building that we have but in general i think that density is something that will influence us a lot in the future until some years ago i used to think that we should have more high-rise buildings and have more than cities so that you can leave green spaces close to the city and not grow too much in, in expansion because i think we all like to have green spaces that are close to our city we don't like when we have to kind of drive for two hours until we finally get out of it but on the other hand, I was told that those um, high-rise buildings don't work so well with, with the urban planning and people tend to stay, uh, I don't know, on the 30th floor and they <laughs> will, <Yeah>. maybe <laughs> wouldn't go down. Yeah. So there are two things. Uh, one thing is I live in a high-rise building in Zurich in the 27th floor. <laughs> 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 I like it very much because I have a perfect view. On the other hand, it's like uh, living in a hotel. So you enter, you go up with a lift, you don't meet your neighbors too much. This is a little bit the problem of these high-rise buildings. Uh, but especially the, the high-rise building that we talked before in Kocharel, this is a very interesting one where they try to compensate the anonymity mm -hmm. of the high-rise with neighborhoods. So they are able to, to bring together three stories within the high-rise with a uh, let's say collective spaces so you come out of the elevator first of all you see uh, uh, maybe double height or even triple height space it's not huge uh -huh, yeah also there are stairs in there uh, you have a collective use and you even see outside you know okay usually yeah, it's really my, smart super smart super eff effective and i think with these recipes you can actually avoid having these kind of monofunctions within the high rises Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the other thing is that in, in the DNA of the skyscraper, it looks great if you push them together like in Manhattan uh, or in Dubai, maybe not so much. <laughs> <laughs> you can create density, but the argument that 
with creating green space and next to the, the high rise at the very end you're not dense. I think with a common block round block building you have the same density. Okay. And in the urban scale I think that's also a much better uh, tool yes. to operate, uh, to create cities, to create urban spaces. I think the, the urban space is mostly the street, you know. And the problem of the high rise is, of course, uh, it's a sculpture and usually doesn't attach to the street. Mm -hmm. This is what we have as a problem in our uh, four high rise towers in the middle of Zurich. They have exactly this kind of park around, yeah. which is a bit fuzzy. Uh, so you come out of the building, then you're on a second level, you're not on street level, and nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and before we were living here at Limmatstrasse, close to the office, it was a regular five story building, a very nice one from the 30s. You, you could come out of the building, you were standing on the street, there were shops, there was a tram, there were people. This is what people actually like, you know. This is the, the, the urban realm that you need in order to, to have like a. Um, Communication. Yeah, in interaction with interaction. The, yeah. This is what an urban space needs. And it's rather hard to achieve with high rise buildings. Yeah. It's delicate. Yeah, yeah. I think there also there is something kind of artificial in these uh, centers like Dubai versus I don't know, Manhattan. Everyone speaks about Manhattan where I probably it kind of just happened so to come. I mean nobody maybe plan for it that way there was a huge uh, of course need and power and there were building regulations it was possible also the ground was was pr pretty okay to do it uh, yeah but it somehow happens this is like mankind works density attracts people and somehow creates uh, interesting spaces yeah but it's not necessary I think in, in, in Manhattan not, The important thing is the street and the block. It's not so much the high rises. Of mm -hmm. course, there are high rises, yeah. but actually, it, it would also work without, you know, mm -hmm. because you have these blocks, uh, the streets and the avenues, and, and this is where people live and where people meet. So this brings me to next project of yours is uh, the Gasabau, and in your description you say that it's designed as a bridge. And I went to Brazil, to Salvador de Bahia, so, some time ago. And uh, we visited the administrative center, which was designed by Lele. And it's kind of a building uh, on a bridge. Or it's, it's elevated. And this is, was also kind of the mentality of the time, is that you separate the living space from cars. Cars are below living space is up mm -hmm. and what you just taught me is kind of uh, the opposite of that uh, yeah so if you speak about this building which really works like a bridge actually it was the sketch of the bridge was done uh, by the engineer yeah which was Daniel Meyer <laughs> 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 and this was really really uh, uh, an early collaboration And I think it was really, really fruitful. We, we started off, it's an office building on the Werkgelände where, where the master builder works, you know? Yeah. So he needed an office space. Around you have trucks, you're around you have people, you're around you have heaps of gravel and stuff like that. So a rough neighborhood. And uh, we started off with a two-story building and uh, he needed, of course, a lot of space underneath to park. And then we said, okay, it might be a wall structure and you, between the walls you can park your cars or have a gravel pit, mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had these two models and we proposed it to Daniel Meyer within this room. And then he said, yeah, that's interesting, but couldn't it be that this building has only two pillars instead of like... A wall system that works like a card house, yeah. which is actually not flexible at all, uh, in order to open up the ground. So this guy is able to, to walk everywhere, to drive everywhere, to park everywhere. Only two pillars and the whole machine is lifted up. It's like a bridge. It's kind of brutalist. 
somehow yes so we were very fascinated by this creative act together yeah. with him because it it was done within five minutes you know <laughs> <laughs> of course not built in five minutes that's, but that's your marketing there <laughs> <laughs> exactly sorry about that <laughs> no, no, but it was him who did the sketch you yeah know? <laughs> and for us it was like wow how how did this happen and how stupid can you be as an architect to think in walls instead of this kind of a system which is a spatial system of a bridge which overhangs on two sides mm -hmm. above these pillars. Yes, this was fascinating very much. Yeah, yeah okay. So, so, but in, let's say in a more urban context, you would prefer anyway if uh, we are connected to the to the ground, we don't separate from the ground. This yeah. was also an idea of Le Corbusier, I think, to kind of elevate us a bit. Not. I'm not sure that he really meant that, but he wanted to be your house to be accessible by car, and it had to be an integrated design with the parking. Yeah, so for instance, in the 20s, he did the Villa Sawa, the famous one in Poissy, which looked like a, a white uh, flat cube uh, lifted on pillars. You don't see the pillars in all those pictures. Yeah. Of course, it has a lot of pillars, which are <laughs> nice. Uh, so there he used the, the entrance uh, yeah, you could drive somehow in and there was also a round glass wall where you could drive around with the car and so on. So this is this heroic idea of having the car on another level than the, the, the pedestrians in order to control or structure the world, which obviously didn't work. Yeah. And in the 60s it was totally perverted. But at that time you have to keep in mind that there were very few cars and look, obviously, he liked cars, ships, and all that stuff because these were like protagonists of the space, like mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And at that time, you didn't have too many of those. Yeah. But they were like fascinating machines, sculptures moving. And then I think it made totally sense to 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 like bring them their stage, you know. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's the opposite. So <laughs> yeah. they became dangerous. They, yeah. they, they became like aliens and in, invading the urban space. And we have to fight them. Yeah. And when, in when the Gasser building, maybe uh, the first reference that you brought with the South American uh, buildings, uh, there's something about it. They, they were like in the heroic phase of the South American architects, like Lina Bobardi's museum, which is yeah. spanning, especially uh, in this case, between two pillars. Uh, they did a lot of things in concrete, uh, erecting huge spaces, open spaces, public spaces. Yeah. Of course, this was also in the back of our heads when we saw this sketch and we immediately found oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, you cannot do it every day. Yeah, it's yeah. A very special yeah, yeah. It's The architecture adapts to the context. Yeah. Okay. And... Then you gave me a third reference, which is, which is the Baumeister House, which is a transformation, if I understood correctly. No. Uh, no, okay, so it's a uh, it's new building. Yes. Okay. But I'm glad that you mentioned it as <laughs> <laughs> transformation. Uh, in the beginning, when it was erected in 2000, what was it, 12, I think? I don't even remember. Many things, people had the impression this is uh, this was standing here and you refurbished it. It had to do with the brick. Ah, okay. Yeah. It had to do with the arches. We we did some arches on the top floor mm -hmm. just to play a little bit with the brick. Yeah. And we had this idea of Louis Kahn and, and the brick and the arches. This somehow could be interesting. So we used <laughs> the arches and, and people had the impression this cannot be modern. This This must be from a time back then. And also the use of two colors in the brick is a little bit rooted in the urban tradition of Zurich, but also other cities like uh, this orange brick or sandy brick and the red brick were often combined mm -hmm. to express a little bit the, 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 also um, the beauty maybe. Playfulness. Yeah. yeah. So it, it actually really worked because... <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it wasn't the intention to do that, to be yeah. honest. It wasn't intended to, to look like that, uh, to, to be a traditional building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just became like that because we, we loved certain issues like having a sockel, a plinth yeah. in concrete elements. But if you go closer, you see the plinth is huge elements that were prefabricated and brought in with the crane. You can detect it if you're closer. Okay, yeah. Also, I think it's a really modern building. 
if you go inside you will see that the, the interior brickwork which are heavy kind of 50 to 50 elements mm -hmm. uh, it's kalk sandstein limestone um, bricks yeah. on the inside yeah. which are doing the masonry and these huge blocks are put on top of each other uh, and they are exposed so yeah. we just painted them because, and this is why we called it the Baumeister house, the, the building of the master uh -huh, builder, okay, yeah. because he came to us and he said, same client as the other building that we just spoke about, uh, yeah. uh, he came to us and he said, I want to have a building, but I want to have my work exposed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and usually <laughs> yeah. he does like the masonry wall and then uh, the, the gypsum comes, uh, does plaster all over. Uh, you don't see whatever he did. The electrician comes and he crashes the whole wall yeah. in order to, to put in the electricity and so on. Everything is covered. This is, a, this is a building culture that we know here because render is a huge topic, of course, mm -hmm. in the city. And he wanted to have it exposed. Okay. So yeah. this was the issue. Uh, we tried to keep the, the brick uh, rough outside, even we put the back side of the brick outside, so it's a little bit more, um, how would you say, you could see the how it was done. Okay, you can see something from the texture. Yeah, because in the manufacturing of the brick, you have some, some kind of t traces. Okay, yeah, when and it's cooked. Yeah, not only the cooking, but the transporting. Uh, leave some traces uh -huh, okay, yeah, and yeah. some uh, imperfections and then on the other side on the Sicht Seite on the, the facial um, it's perfect and we didn't want the perfection we wanted to see something of the making of the brick itself so it makes it a bit more comfortable to look like because there are traces there are imperfections and also on the inside we try to keep that huge blocks uh, visible so you have exposed uh, concrete work, like in this office, for the ceilings. Everything you touch is, is actually there to, to, to hold the building. Okay. Sounds really exciting. I have some, let's say, follow-up questions on that, because now we talked about projects that we have done. Mm -hmm. And maybe you had, now let's have a look into the future. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you about sustainability because everyone's talking about it. It's a huge topic. And how, if you integrate it in your designs, how you deal with it? Uh, is it only on the material side? Is it uh, a holistic approach? What do, you th what do you think about it? You can just tell me yeah, your thoughts. Yeah, I, th I think it's both. Basically, we have to create spaces that really work and we have to create density as well. I mean, the more, first of all, the more uh, dense something is, the more inf the less infrastructure it needs. This is sustainable in itself. Yeah. So you shouldn't do single family houses uh, like in a greenery. You should uh, bring them close to the city. I think everybody knows it today. So nobody wants to, to have the, the, the whole country um, covered with single-family houses that's not clever everybody has a yeah. garden but this garden is actually uh, an artificial space so i rather prefer to have dense cities let's say so we should go towards this direction dense quarters where we speak about again about interaction and and bringing people together yeah uh, this is something and then on the other side you have the material and i think both are, are needed uh, we do a lot of things now, especially in competitions with uh, wooden buildings. We also like to work with wood, of course. And I think that's the future, of course. I did a project with uh, the students in the university last semester, building a high-rise building at Silke in Zurich mm -hmm. in wood. Yeah. It wasn't easy for them because there's a lot of technicalities. Also, the, the fire protection is not easy, but you can build high-rise buildings in wood. That's possible. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there was a mix use inside, not only apartments, but also like co-working and so on. So at the very end, sustainable buildings are the ones that are flexible for adaptions. This is what we learned, I think. Uh, you cannot build just an apartment building that will stay forever. You should also be able to th rethink it. Or if you build a, an office building, at the very end, it should be also 
transformable into into a residential building. That's a bit difficult with wood, isn't it? Because you usually have smaller spans than you would have, let's say, with concrete or steel. Yeah, uh, but on the other hand, uh, right now we have an example of a. And this is this was brought also by Danny May to us yeah. of, a, of an Eschenstütze ash. Yeah. An ash column, which is a high density column that can do a lot of, uh, bring together a lot of forces. So in the lower parts, this is in Kochareal, we have a concrete structure. The span is eight meters 10. And in the attic floor, we have these ash pillars, uh, yeah. piloti, and they do for the attic floor exactly the same together with a, with a wooden ceiling. In the lower floors, we cannot do it because we have to keep two tons per square meter. Oh, okay. This is yeah. almost impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, a, in an apartment building, actually, it's easy to, to go on with columns. And uh, the, the problematic part is, is what are the walls? But I think that the more we, we talk about structure and architecture, I think that the structure always has a longer lifespan. It should have. Yeah. In the very end, it can also be a structure that is, in that sense, um, stable and resilient. If it's in concrete, it doesn't even matter if it holds for 200 years, for instance. You Some know? people think that structures are forever. <laughs> yeah, but this is a very European thinking. If you go to Japan, in Japan, the, the regular house has 20 years of a lifespan. The house oh, really? in itself. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of another thinking. So actually there, the, the whole building culture is remodeling itself every 20 years. Of course, you have old buildings as well in mm -hmm. Kyoto, in the old quarters, yeah. but uh, they have different lifespans. And I think here in the Western part or in the European part, we have this idea of the medieval city, which is nice. And I think it's also good to keep the centers. They wanted to raise all of them in the modern yeah. ages. <laughs> <laughs> and we can profit now uh, because they didn't. Uh, I think... Structures should have a long lifespan as long as possible. And then they can be really, really sustainable. Yeah, because you and me and I think many other people, they had already an experience living in an old building. So I don't know. For sure, if you go to Italy or uh, Spain, at some point in your life, you would probably live in a building that's from the 50s, 30s, or maybe even, I don't know, 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an experience here in, in Europe, which is uh, unique, I guess, and that's nice. I once said uh, uh, to the former um, boss of the Amsterdam Academy of, of uh, Architecture uh, as a reviewer in Liechtenstein, and he said, actually, the most sustainable building is the one that stands the longest. And he lives in a Grachtenhaus in, in, in um, Amsterdam, yeah. along the canal. They are maybe, I don't know, from four to five meters, a long slot. They have brick walls uh, as a facade. Inside, they are like timber structures. The, the dividing walls are mostly also brick. And within this structure, you can do everything. So his house is like from 1780, whatever, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> But the longer it lasts and the longer you can adapt it, the more, the more often you can adapt it to, to recent needs, uh, the more sustainable it is. I think Dutch people also really adapt easily to those buildings. They love it. Yeah. Uh, they really love it. I think the, the worst case in, in, in thinking about sustainability is the one that tries to resolve everything with uh, technicalities. We also work with solar panels, of course. Yeah, yeah. But I think that you cannot resolve the world or <laughs> the, these issues with a, with a, it. I would never drive a Tesla right now because my car has 20 years and the longer I drive it, the more sustainable it is. Yeah, yeah. I would never break it and buy a Tesla because I don't think I'm a, sustainable with this action because there's a huge battery you know yeah, yeah what happens with batteries of course you will recycle them in the future but the whole energy that you put into the, the building of a new car is not needed right now because the old one still works yeah yeah i really like this approach as well okay uh, maybe to finish off because it's already almost an hour that we've been talking <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> seem like um i would like to ask you 
is there a place that you would go to to discover um, architecture that you didn't expect? If you if you do if you would do a trip, so I am getting married in autumn, and if I would like your advice to go to see some great architecture, where would you send me to? Well, you, you mentioned that you've been in South America already. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wasn't in Sao Paulo, uh, so I would go there uh, because I think there's a huge tradition there in in having these 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 materials. You know. That they treat them in an excellent way. They also have very dense cities. Uh, I love that. And on the same time, a very, uh, maybe also aggressive climate and a tropical <laughs> climate that surrounds these cities. So a lot of contradictions. I would send you to Japan because Japan has also a, a really diverse building culture, mm -hmm. a huge tradition in, in wood carpentry. And I think this holistic idea of building, uh, somehow it, it, it is totally forgotten uh, through the 60s and these ruptures that they had. And now I'm not sure where they really stand with their architectural uh, focal point, you know. But I think it's really diverse and uh, it's somehow an island still. Yeah. If you go to Japan, you, you're always the gajin. Uh, they they look at you. I just talked to a student two days ago. He was there after his uh, diploma, and uh, he said, "Actually, you're always the foreign guy. They even come to you and want to do a selfie, or they want to touch you, whatever." <laughs> so you're an, an exotic kind of uh, animal there, and this might be pretty interesting for us to to see uh, to be in a neighborhood or a surrounding much more where you are the stranger. Usually in our um, cultures we are we think we are not exotic you know yeah. and we behave like we behave and that, that's a different way of being exposed and that might also sharpens the perception for for the culture that you see there but also coming back then to see what surrounds you yeah yeah maybe this could be an advice but actually i think you can go Whatever you want to. <laughs> I yeah, think yeah, even the course, building culture yeah. of Africa is huge, and I would love to go there. So the world is, well, there are many places to go, and I think culture never ends. And my, I mentioned in the beginning, my, my daughter is studying architecture right now in the first or in the second semester. And if I look at what they can learn, like architectural history and architectural theory and uh, theory of arts, all that stuff, uh, Städte or urbanism, yeah. I would love to go into these lectures. So I think the older I get, the more uh, interested I am in all these things. So you can like rewind the stuff and learn it again. And I think traveling is learning. Yeah, probably this is what you do. Expose yourself to other cultures and try to soak up as much as you can. Well, thank you very much. I, I think we could close on this one. This was a very nice quote. And thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity. <laughs>